And all of God's children said, Amen and Amen. Praise the Lord. We're talking about today, only Jesus satisfies. Now I could talk about that from many different perspectives, but I want you to think about this. As God took me through this this past week, He said, only Jesus satisfies and only Jesus satisfied. Jesus, Jesus satisfied, he says, in regards to God's full and complete plan of salvation at the cross of Calvary with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Bible says the Father is satisfied. He's satisfied with you and I bringing the blood of his Son. He says the blood of his Son whereby you and I have been totally forgiven. But I think about this. From means of contentment, realizing that we seek for contentment many times in our lives. We're, we're running after things in this life thinking that they will satisfy. There's songs that have been written about that. I have a couple of them. If you want to bring up one on the screen, Jody, I had a couple of hymns that I had in mind. All Things in Jesus is one of them and In the Garden. All Things in Jesus says friends all around us are trying to find what the heart yearns for by sin in your mind. I have the secret. I know where it is found only in Jesus True pleasure abounds. It goes on in the chorus and says, All that I want is in Jesus. He satisfies. Joy He supplies. Life would be worthless without Him. All things in Jesus I find. The second verse says, or third verse, I picked that one out. No other name thrills the joy chords within. And through none else is remission of sin. He knows the pain of the heart sorely tried. All of his needs will in him be supplied. He knows. This is what caught me. Not only is only through him is remission of sin, but he knows the pain of the heart sorely sorely tried. God said, I will not allow you to be tempted above that which you're able to bear, but will with the temptation, I will provide, he says, a way of escape. I will provide a mountain passageway. I will get you out of the trouble, he says. I will take a hold of your hand and lead you, he says, to higher ground. That's the God that you and I serve. He knows whether your heart has been sorely tried. I said this past week on Thursday to a fellow worker, I said, it grieves my heart. For people that are going through difficulties, I have one guy that was down there in one of our locations on Wednesday when the supervisor got back, he was in tears and everybody left. He said, what's wrong? He said, the doctors gave me, he says, some medicine to take care of an infection in my throat and it's only given to cancer patients. He says, you don't have cancer or the doctor would have told you that. Get that out of your head. On the way back, him and I were talking a lot. We had a meeting down there, left at 12.30, drove seven hours coming home. He's in one truck. We're running together. We're talking most of the time. We get into the Washington, D.C. area. We're talking about the end times. Now, you need to know this guy. I've been working with him since 1979. But he said to me as we're traveling up, he said, this world needs more Christianity. I was at his son's wedding last night up at Bear Creek Mountain Resort. We prayed a prayer there. We didn't officiate the wedding, but we prayed a prayer and different ones were responding because we were declaring the name of Jesus Christ. But when we were traveling around Washington, D.C., him and I both on a call, our call has not been dropped, we're running right together. I don't count it as coincidental, but we were talking about the coming of the Lord. He said, you know, you know who I think the Antichrist is. Now, this guy's talking about prophetic things. Now, let me tell you something. He said, you know who this is coming from? I said, yeah, I know who it's coming from. He said, you know who I think is the Antichrist? I said, no, I don't. He said, you don't know? I said, no, I don't know. Well, when he said his name, boom, our telephones went off. Shut it down. Now, they came back up a little bit later. We were talking. He says, hey, wasn't that weird? I said, yeah, kind of weird. Big brother, does he listen to your conversations? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. That's not the point. Our Heavenly Father's looking, listen to our conversations. And I'm not searching for the Antichrist. My eyes are on the eastern sky to Jesus Christ. I'm not really trying to figure out who he is, for I know who he is. I'm not worried about my concerns for tomorrow, for I know who holds tomorrow. Amen? And only He truly satisfies. And so I think about these songs. There's another one here in the garden. It's called here, in the garden, I will come to the garden alone. While the dew is still on the roses, and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. Now, I say that because it was written by a man by the name of Charles Austin Miles. In 1892, Charles Austin Miles went to Philadelphia College of Pharmacy. He also went to the University of Pennsylvania. He gave up both of those. He became the manager of Hallmark Company. 
that produces, he says, music, whether it be sheet music or he says actually recording. And back in those days, I don't know what they were recording, but at the same time, he wrote this in 1912. He was also a photographer. He spent time making his own dark room, and he was able to read the Bible, he says, under the red light that was in the dark room. So he says one day, he says while he was waiting, his Bible just dropped open to John, the 20th chapter. And he said in reading that, he found out that Mary, she ran to the tomb, and when she ran to the tomb, he says, she looked inside and said, oh, he's not here? And so he said he was basically seeing himself in that same setting in the garden. And when it says here in the chorus, if you flip to the next slide here, it says, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. Now I want you to get that part. I want you to get the fact that Jesus tells you that you are his own. I don't care what the enemy says. He's a liar, the father of lies. There's no truth in him. We realize he was a gorgeous angel that actually led praise until his fall. And his fall took place, the Bible says, prior to the creation of mankind. And you and I could go into that entire Genesis, the first chapter, and talk about all the things that God has done. But we know that this, he says, created angel by God is the one that rebelled against God and took a third of the angels of heaven with him. We know that he is beautiful in looks, yet at the same time he's a deceiver. The Bible says he's a liar. He's the father of lies. There's no truth in him. He tries to tell you that you can get satisfaction some other place. And I do believe that's the reason why Mick Jagger and also Keith Richards, they wrote, I can't get no satisfaction in June of 1965. Remember that song? Basically, Keith Richards, he wrote the music, and there was Mick Jagger putting the words to it. And even though it was, was released in June of 1965 in the United States of America, it wasn't allowed to be played except for on pirate radio stations until July or August of that same year in the UK. Because the UK said it's too explicit in the sexual conduct, he says, within that song. Not only was there frustration in not being able to find the satisfaction in a sexual way, but they also were plagued with commercialism as well. So these two guys basically hampered in trying to find satisfaction some way, sought satisfaction in every way, and found nothing because there's no satisfaction outside of Jesus Christ and brought forth, I thought, a double negative within the sentence of saying, I can't get no. Now, I'm not an English major, but I was told no double negatives in the same sentence. And there's the enemy Trump coming, he says, to rob, to kill and destroy, to lure people and say, you know what, I will give you all these things, as he said to Jesus, if you'll just bow down and worship me. And some people feel like they have bowed down and worshiped the Lord, and therefore there's no turning back to them for them. But I'll tell you right now, Jesus Christ is greater than all of your sin. Every single bit of it. And somebody that thinks they've already given themselves to the enemy, that's also a lie of the enemy. That's someone that doesn't know what he's talking about. For our Savior, Jesus Christ, does greater things than you and I could ever, ever imagine. And he certainly does walk with me. He talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. It will blow you away. It's greater than anything. It's Jesus that satisfies. The next verse says this. I thought we had the other verse, but we don't. That's fine. But here's a guy right here that needs to talk to you. Because here's one that sought satisfaction to his name is Solomon. Now, I like what was mentioned here. It says this. It says, The human heart is too big for the world to fill. Try to fill it with fame. They try to fill it with pleasure or money. But your heart was made for something far greater. Yet God is too big for your heart, but God miraculously through the work of the Holy Spirit came into your heart to occupy your heart. And to realize that when you discover that, you find true fulfillment. But here, Solomon. Solomon said, I have the power. I have the power to enjoy every whim, every fantasy, every desire, I can indulge in the flesh, and whatever I set my eyes to, I will do it. And Solomon came to the place to say, you know what? 
it doesn't satisfy. He says here, So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me, he says. In the 10th verse, And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. Whatever I thought I wanted, I tried it to see if it would bring some type of satisfaction in my life, and I found that it doesn't. He says, I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. He says in the 11th verse, Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexations of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. All was vanity, and it was annoying. And there's no satisfaction in it at all. And so you and I, I do believe, have discovered that ourselves. To know this, and I like this statement, everything without Christ is empty. Everything without Jesus Christ just is empty. So we look at something like, you know what, maybe if you can hit the lottery, maybe if you can hit the mega million, maybe you can get a bigger home, maybe you can get a nicer car, maybe you can put money in all of your family's pockets, and maybe you can build them all a home, but none of that will satisfy. You find out that God says to a man like this, Solomon, who had 700 wives and 300 concubines, that they did not satisfy. 700 wives, 300 concubines, they didn't satisfy. God even told David, do not take many wives. Do not take much silver and gold, he says. But we find out that many times your heart is drawn in that direction rather than realizing there's only one that satisfies. And you can call them, and we can all call them wasted years. And, and I'll say that, you know, wasted years, even of my life in areas. You can say, well, wasted years, and I pray this, God, you're the God of restoration. You're the God that's able to make up what was taken away. And you tell me that it has to be paid back sevenfold. You are greater than all things. And yet sometimes, even as I mentioned, we still try to decipher sin. We say, well, you know what? Mine's not as great as yours. And maybe yours isn't as great as the next person. But it took the blood of Jesus Christ to wash them all away. And they're all the same in a sight. And we've talked about this before. Well, you know, the Bible speaks about a greater sin. The greater sin, there's only one. And that's the rejection of Jesus Christ as Savior. That's the greater sin. That's the sin against the Holy Spirit. We realize the Holy Spirit's job is an entire lifetime. He speaks in your life, my life, all of our lives, and in the lives of everyone in the world, speaking to them in an individual way. He says he's the one that satisfies. 1 John, the second chapter, 1 and 2. If you sin, he says, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who's the propitiation for all of your sins. And not only for your sins but everybody's sins, the sin of the whole world. He's washed it away. And that's the reason why Paul tells you to go with the ministry of reconciliation and tell your brothers and sisters, be reconciled. God's already redeemed you. God's already reconciled you through the death of his son. And now you're his, and he is yours. And I pray even as Solomon said in the latter chapter, or latter chapters of Ecclesiastes, he said, remember the Lord in the day of your youth. And so we know that God's able to impact, but I ask you, brothers and sisters in Christ, to gather together in the name of Jesus and just lift up prayer in the name of Jesus towards people. Let me tell you something. Prayer was ordained by God for a reason. It was ordained not only that you and I could place our burdens and roll them over on Him, but at the same time to realize it does us good. He benefits us. It blesses us because we know we have one that's far greater than anything. We can bring, he brings encouragement. He brings comfort. He takes away fear. He does every bit of it. Through his workmanship. Look at our next scripture here with me, please. It's found here in the book of Matthew, the 12th chapter, the 38th verse. Then certain of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. So, hey, show us a sign, Jesus. And Jesus says here, but he answered and said unto them, All evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign, he says, of the prophet Jonas. What's the sign? For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly, he says, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. I am, he says, the I am. 
I am the sign. I will die, be buried three days, and I will rise again. The Father told me that I can lay down my life and I can take it up again. The Bible says the Father raised him up. The Son raised himself up. The Holy Spirit raised him up. The great three in one, he says, there's no power in heaven and earth could stop the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says, I am the sign. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And he goes on to say this. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. A greater than Jonas is here. Then he goes on to say this. The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And he says this, behold, a greater than Solomon is here. So Solomon talked about all the things that he sought after and said that everything is vanity and vexation of the Spirit and there's nothing new under the sun, but we find out here that Jesus is saying there's a greater than Solomon that is here. Solomon couldn't find satisfaction in the things he tried to enjoy in this life, but he says a greater than Solomon is here. I want you to know this in every single person's life. When you think about wisdom, and God's been showing me this. I've been thinking of this at work. I said, God, when someone comes in here, they're supposed to be able to see that this shop actually... Marvel as the Queen of Sheba marveled. When the Queen of Sheba marveled, she marveled at the fact that, oh, your servants, your household, look how everything is conducted. I said, God, isn't that the way it's supposed to be where I am? If somebody walks in, they marvel at how things are conducted. It's supposed to be easy. It's not supposed to be stressful. It's supposed to be you giving us wisdom in every area. You're the one that satisfies. And so many times we lose track because we're looking at numbers rather than looking at people. Looking at numbers rather than looking at people. Trying to hit goals rather than say, you know what? This soul is more precious than that goal. This soul is more precious than all the wealth of the entire world. One soul, he said, is worth more than all the riches of the entire world. You have souls around you all the time. Pointing the direction of one that can satisfy us, it's Jesus. He said, oh, I tried that Jesus stuff. I don't care about that Jesus. You know what? Just keep speaking, keep praying, keep declaring Jesus Christ over their life. Amen? Look at this next script here with me, please. It says here in John, the fourth chapter, the ninth verse, here we have a woman. And this woman, you all know about it. But Jesus tells her, I'm the only one that satisfies. This woman had fallen, failed relationships, one after the other, five in number. She was on her sixth one, the Bible says. Failed relationships, illicit pleasures, and also empty religiosity. Basically saying, you know what, I'm going to try this, and that's the faith of Judaism, saying that we come on this mountain to worship the Lord. God said there'll be a time when he says, when no man will come on this mountain, you will worship me in spirit and in truth. So she sees Jesus in three different, or four different levels. We've talked about this before, but I want you to see this. Because this is the way it is. We can talk about, oh, you know, she had six husbands, the seventh one being Jesus Christ, full, complete. Jesus Christ is her husband, truly. But I, I want you to realize that Jesus went to someone who was stricken in their heart. Someone, he says, that tried to find satisfaction, could not find satisfaction because your heart was not made, he says, to be satisfied with the things of this life. Even yesterday when we were at a wedding, it's not the husband and the wife. that the husband, you meet the needs of the wife, and, and wife, you meet the needs of the husband. You can't meet the needs of your wife. She can't meet your needs. Only Jesus can meet your needs. And you two need to keep pointing each other in the direction of Jesus. For he is and has met every one of your needs. As I was standing there, we have Sarah Elizabeth and we have William there. Sarah means princess. What did we say last week Elizabeth means? The oath of God or the promise of God. So I said, Will, here's the promise of God to give you a princess. Her name is Sarah Elizabeth. Will, what does your name mean? Determined protector. I said, God has called you to be a protector of your wife, determined protector. I said, that's a story right there in itself. As this marriage comes together, we find out that God brings us about to show you and I that he has given us, he says to Jesus, as his promise, realizing through the work of Jesus, the bridegroom, that he would make a full provision where he can adorn us, he says, as bride that's adorned in white, that he has made us perfect, he says, in every single aspect. And he is a determined protector. He is the one that protects and watches over you and I. He's the one that keeps the enemy, he says, at bay, realizing even though he's been defeated, he always tries to come back to you and plant lies in your mind. 
Plant words in your mind. I pray in Jesus' name that you and I will be lifted up above discouragement because we will see the things that God says rather than what the enemy declares. I see what God says. This is what you say. So many times we get up because we see good. We get down because we don't see the things that are good. But God says to just, that's you and I. What are we supposed to do? We simply says to walk by faith. Amen? So he mentions this. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, she calls him a Jew, ask us to drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Tenth verse. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, if thou knewest what truly satisfies, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked me, ask of him, and he would have given thee living water. Eleventh verse. The woman saith unto him, Sir, Thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Twelfth verse. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Thirteenth verse. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Whoso drinketh of this water will never be satisfied. This world will never satisfy. I remember my dad many times. You know, My dad was always one that... Uh, you save your money, you go out and you buy something. He said, if a pint appliance fails, dishwasher fails, he says, oh, it feels good to be able to go out and buy that and put it in. And uh, there was a time when they couldn't do that. He says, you're able to buy, and he says, that brings a temporary satisfaction. New boat in the driveway, new motorcycle, new truck, temporary satisfaction, but maybe it lasts a week, maybe it lasts two weeks, and then it's gone. But there's only one thing that satisfies when I was in Jamaica, I found out what I felt was true contentment. When I was growing up, I found out a lady that I was kind of scared of because this lady like lived in a shack. We called it a shack because she had no pain on her house whatsoever. She had no electricity. I was 12 years old or younger. And we kind of ride real quick past her house. Had no driveway going up to it. But one day we went in there. I don't know whether it was Christmas or what. We, we decided to go into her house. We went into her house. There was no electricity. There was no television. There was a wood-burning stove. That was it. That's what you used. And yet this elderly lady sat there with total contentment and spoke to us very softly. And I can never forget her giving us some candy. What was her provisions? I don't know how she was provided for. I really don't. I know that there's people throughout the world as far as their provisions being met. So many times you find out in this one case, and this was a minister of the gospel who planted over 100 churches, went to see his mother with a fellow minister. When they did, she met them, a lady in her upper 70s, met them when they were coming down her walkway, took them in the house, and she gave them for lunch cucumbers and tomatoes. That was vegetables in the summertime, a very simple garden, and she raised one pig, slaughtered it in the fall, and, and certainly ate off that the winter, winter long. But the happiest woman in the world. Why? Because Jesus satisfies when I was in Jamaica and I had, I came out of a bank in Christiana and literally we, we flew into Montego Bay. We drove down to Trelawney Beach. We went inward from there. I mean, we went to the very inside of Jamaica. It was about building a church and we were there on a Friday night and I can remember one time being in this little shack with one light bulb hanging down the middle, a dirt floor. It was about 12 by 12. We gathered there. Someone else preached. We let them do it, certainly. Walked out of there, so pitch dark, I almost walked into a horse's rear on, on, a, on a mountain. I, thought, I called it a mountain. It was 7,200 feet. It was Silent Hill. It was the highest peak, higher than anything east of the Mississippi River in the United States. Clemens Dome is about 6,600 feet. This was 7,200 feet Silent Hill. And yet, totally content people. Had one guy, when I came out of that bank, I cashed in 500 bucks, got 10,000 Jamaican dollars. He says, I carry a machete. People go, hey, Mon, you know, give me some money, Mon. And I, I'd give him money. I believe, you know, anybody carrying a machete, you give to those who ask, you know, and just whatever, whatever you want. Took me up on top of a hill, said, let me show you my place. He had a corrugated hut that maybe was six foot by ten foot, had a bed in there, a dirt floor, and said, I want to show you where I live. And he was smiling, look at this. Look out there, that, see my garden? That, look at my garden, there's my garden. He was happy. I came back from there saying, oh my Lord. We were driving in a car coming into Montego Bay, we had four people in the back seat of a little car. I'm on the right-hand side, driving on the wrong side of the road, on the wrong side of the car, changing gears with the wrong hand, trying to come down off this mountain, and everything's close, no guardrails. And I got four people in the back, maybe five, 
Three of them were children, and not one of them said a word the whole time. They'd say, oh, you're touching me. Put it, move over. You know, you're hogging all the air. They'd say a word. I came into Montego Bay. I remember being in a jewelry store, and it was a, not a jewelry store, but some kind of a store. There was a Swiss Army knife right there, and a little boy that was with us was looking at that Swiss Army knife, and I didn't buy it for him. I still, you know, to the day, wish I'd have bought it for him. Didn't ask for it. I knew he wanted it, and I didn't buy it. Point is, they didn't ask. It was amazing. Contentment. That's what God, God who truly satisfies. This won't satisfy you. You will thirst again. But the 14th verse says this. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst again. You will be satisfied. I satisfy. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up, he says, into, he says, everlasting life. A well, a living water, it satisfies. Joy he supplies. Life would be worthless without him. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So let's look at this. I want you to look here in the book of Isaiah 55, 2. Do we have that? Next verse, maybe. Isaiah 55, 2. Wherefore do we spend money? For that which is not bread, and your labor says, for that which satisfieth not, Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Look at with me, please, in the book of John, the sixth chapter, 35. It says, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. I am the one that satisfies. You were created. You were, a, certainly are this, a spirit being given a soul housed within a body. A spirit being given a soul housed within a body. We find out that we try to satisfy the soul battling for whether the flesh is satisfied or whether the spirit, he says, we suck them to the spirit or we listen to the spirit. No, it's, it's the flesh. Satisfy the flesh. Well, the flesh can't be satisfied without, any, without anything else than the spirit of God. That's it. Well, you know, you say, well, lust, 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 lust is never satisfied. I don't care whether... In any area you're talking about, many times we think of towards the sexual line, but it's not. I'm talking about in any area it's not satisfied. I think I'll eat more. Uh, one hamburger wasn't enough, maybe I'll try two hamburgers. Maybe I'll try three next time. French fries with it, maybe a large Coke. Something, we've got to satisfy this hunger. It's not satisfied. We find out that we're only satisfied in Christ Jesus. And so the reason why I'm saying this is because so many times we have people around us and ourselves as well. We're seeking satisfaction outside of the one who truly satisfies. Jesus satisfies you. You know that. And if you know that, enjoy that, receive that. But I want you to share that as well. Enjoy that, receive that, understand that this is a spiritual warfare going on. That Satan desires, he says, even though he can't get a soul, he cannot get a soul that's saved he tries still to destroy their faith, destroy our faith, and get us, he says, to not enjoy the things that God has for us to truly enjoy in Christ Jesus our Lord. Look at Psalm with me, please. Psalm 107. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for His good, for His mercy does what? His mercies endure forever, forever His mercies are. Let the redeemed, that's you and I, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let us say so whom He hath redeemed, he says, from the hand of the enemy. And the ninth verse says this. For he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with his goodness. He satisfies the longing soul. My mind, my will, my emotions, God satisfies all of it. Thank you, Jesus. You truly satisfy. And then he goes on to say this in John the seventh chapter. 37, in the last days, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. 38, he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Out of his belly shall flow rivers, he says, of living water. I want you to look at this next verse with me, please. And this is one that I've used many times, and we can go ahead and memorize. We've memorized that. We can quote things. Right here it says, in the book of Psalm, I don't, I'm not going to probably get into this too, too, too much. Let, let me just jump. Just I'll briefly talk about this. I, wasn't, I, don't, if you get, I don't have time to really get into this. I'll talk about this maybe next week. We'll say something about it. But this is talking about the days of your life. We'll just go ahead and hit it real quick. 
Moses wrote this. Moses lived to be 120 years old. The Bible says your days are 70 by reason of strength 80. It says but Moses lived to be 120. I want you to see what goes on in life. I'm talking about a life that's 70, 80 years long and living that life under not being satisfied and always fearing that you're under the anger of the Lord. I want you to see this. For we are consumed by thine anger, he says, and by the wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. That's what plagues many people. I'm always thinking about, oh, I'm only getting what I deserve, you know. You, you sow what you reap. No, he wasn't talking in Galatians 6 about sowing what you reap as far as our sin condition. He's talked about the law and grace there. Don't be sowing the law. He goes on to say this, For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. Here again, anger, wrath, under God. Every single day he's taking account. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The tenth verse, The days of our years are threescore years and ten. Seventy, if by reason of strength they'll be eighty years or fourscore years. Yet is there strength, labor, and sorrow? For it is soon cut off and we fly away. And all those years, it's, it's, it's sorrow, he says. No. Who knoweth the power of thine anger, even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. Okay. That's all they were thinking about under the Old Testament law. This is Moses, always concerned about the wrath of God being upon them. God's delivered us from the wrath. Look at what he says here in Psalm 91. The very next verse, uh, next psalm, I'm sorry. Because you and I have set our love upon God, he showed us he truly satisfies. He brings us to the place where he breaks through the darkness in our life. He sets up his light within us. He reigns from within. Therefore will I deliver you, I will set you on high because he hath known my name. He goes on to say, He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. And here it is. I will deliver him and honor him. And what's he going to do? With long life will I satisfy you. And what I'll do? I'll show you my salvation. Not the anger, not the wrath that Moses talked about. 70, 80 years of it. Always living under that anger or wrath of God. No, Jesus Christ has delivered us from the wrath of God. For he was made, he says, sin for you and I who knew no sin. And then God even says in Psalm 54, I'm sorry, in Isaiah 54, 9, as we've talked about many times, for this is as the waters of Noah unto me, for as I have sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth. I will not be angry against you anymore. I will not rebuke you. I now live within you, and I have redeemed you. So when we think about this, I realize that Jesus Christ is not only the way, the truth, and the life, but Jesus Christ is the one, he says, that satisfies the longing heart, the hungry soul. And so as we go to prayer, I pray in Jesus' name this, that you have an eternal destiny on your life. You've been called. You've been called. You've been, he says, chosen. He talks about being faithful in the book of Revelation. Yeah, he calls us. He chooses us. He's the one who's faithful, the second person in the Holy Trinity. He satisfies. I pray that your relationship with Jesus Christ, he'll see that there's fountains of living water springing up within you. He says that overflow out of you, just like the psalmist said in Psalm 23, my cup runneth over. It runs over for a purpose. It runs over in your life so it may affect other people's lives. And so as we do that, I pray in Jesus' name that he will cause that to abound in such a way that all of us will have our eyes in a certain direction, and that's towards Jesus Christ. And if your brother or sister don't, point in that way. And when you do, we realize that the temporary things here in this earth that may be a trial or a difficulty are soon to pass away, and you and I will soon be in the presence of He who is eternal, understanding that we'll be with Jesus Christ forevermore. And let's go before Him and bow our hearts. Dear Lord, I want to thank you today for the reality of your word. Satan has been rebuked. Satan has been defeated at the cross of Calvary. He can't win. And certainly he can't in any way rob that which you've already secured. I pray in Jesus' name, Father, that you will be the one who breaks through the discouraged heart. You will, you will break through those who are suffering and hurting, those who are having pain right now because of past experiences in whatever way they are that you will bring such a healing in their life that it's heartfelt, spirit-felt right now in the name of Jesus. God, you are, you are more faithful than our words can ever even declare. You're working in areas that we can't even imagine. 
Certainly you're going to work everything together for good. We need to stand on that word. God, you have promised to work all things together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to your purpose. So Father, somehow, some way, you've held yourself to a promise. Somehow, some way, you, you've got to fulfill that promise. Somehow, some way, you're, you're true to your word, whether we can see it or not. So we see you glorified today. We see your power, your workmanship, your great grace flowing in a mighty way. We thank you for it all. For we choose to praise you and realize we shall mount up with wings as eagles. We shall run and not be weary. We shall walk and not faint. We shall be people, Lord, of God. Yes, the young men shall grow weary and they may faint, but those that wait upon the Lord, you're going to renew our strength. The renewal of our strength in such a way that it can't be anything but apparent in our lives as well as those that are around us. And we give you glory, praise, and honor for it all. For we ask it all in Jesus' name and all of God's children said amen. Let's get on our feet.